Okay, now I am recording, right? Yes, you are recording. Okay. I gleam like a mirror. So the lady sees herself as a mirror that reflects the conventions of her society. Okay, so this means that she is not her, her real self. She is not a real living human being. Now, the idea of mirror reminds me, and I mentioned this in the Shakespeare course, the idea of the mirror reminds me of the mimetic theory of literary criticism. This theory maintains that art in general, be it literature or fine arts, is a mirror that imitates reality. It reflects reality. And here the lady sees herself as a mirror that reflects the conditions, the conventions, the customs, the codes of behavior of her society. So she doesn't act out of her own will. She is a woman ripped stripped of her own identity and will. Okay, so her identity is imposed on her by the society. So she doesn't have the freedom of choice, the freedom of acting, or the freedom of expressing herself. At this facet, the bridegroom arrives Lord of the Mirrors. Okay, now she compares the customs of her society to mirrors. Okay, and she compares these customs to pieces, to articles of clothing that she puts on. So each custom is like a kind of dress. Okay, so she is dressed with the conventions of her society. So this is the significance of the title Perda. Perda means isolating women from the male figures of her society. And this woman is isolated. She is isolated from her inner self, from her real identity. Okay, so the bridegroom here is the male figure. The bridegroom is the husband who is the lord of the mirrors. Okay, so she is a lady covered <coughs> with mirrors, and her husband owns O W N S or possesses these mirrors. It is himself. He guides in among these silk screens. This rustling appurtenances. Again, I mentioned last time that the silk screens, the rustling appurtenances, are the customs that are like clothes that the lady puts on. So the husband guides himself among these customs. He doesn't guide himself into her inner nature. He doesn't guide himself into her as a real living human being. So it sounds that the husband is married to the conventions of his society. He is not married to a real human being. This is what she is saying. So according to the lady, a woman in a patriarchal society is married to a male figure. And the male figure is not married to a real human being. He is married to the customs and conventions of this society. So this is the woman. So the function of the wife or the girl is to reflect the customs and the conventions of her society. I breathe. Here it is breathe, not breathe. There is a difference. B R E A T H E, this is the verb. And you pronounce it breathe. B R E A T H is the noun, it is breath. I breathe. And the mouth veil stirs its curtain. 
Okay, so there is a veil, a cover on her lips. So this means that she doesn't have the freedom to express herself. Okay, so the veil is symbolic of the ideas that the society wants her to express. Okay, so she doesn't express her own ideas, her own thoughts. She expresses the ideas and the thoughts that the society approves of. So that's why she says, I breathe, and the mouth veil stares its curtain. Okay, so this means that she doesn't have the freedom of expressing herself. My eye veil is a concatenation of rainbows. Again, there is a veil that covers her eyes. So she doesn't see the world, W-O-R-L-D, world. She doesn't see the world. She doesn't see reality with her own eyes. She views the world with the eyes of her society. Okay? So that's why she says, my eye veil is a concatenation of rainbows. Okay, i.e. points of view that are completely different from her own, a concatenation, i.e. a collection of different rainbows. Okay, now we know that the rainbow is a reflection of or is a refraction, this is what we call it in physics, a refraction of the white color, which is the color of the sunlight. So the white color is made up of seven colors. So when the sunlight falls on a drop of water, we get the rainbow. So we see the colors of the rainbow, the red, the blue, the purple, the orange, and what have you. So here the rainbow shows us the reality of the white color or the white light. Okay, so here the lady doesn't have one rainbow. Her eyes are covered with a concatenation of rainbows. I see she has views of the world that are completely different from her own view of the world. Okay, so here the lady lacks the freedom of expressing herself, i.e. speaking. She lacks the freedom of viewing the world from her own perspective. Therefore, she views the world from the point of view of her society. Even in his absence, i.e. even in the absence of her husband, I revolve in my sheer impossibles, priceless and quiet, among these parakeets, macaws. Okay, even in his absence, I revolve in my sheath of impossibles. Even during the absence of her husband, she doesn't dare, dare, D-A-R-E, even in the absence of her husband, she doesn't dare challenge the conventions of her society. Okay? In other words, in the presence as well as in the absence of her husband, she acts according to the dictates of her society. So that's why she says, even in his absence, I revolve in my sheath of impossibles. So the sheath of impossibles is the clothes, the perda that she puts on, the social conventions. Priceless and quiet, 
Cretaceous prices and quiet among these parakeets macaws. The parakeets in this line and the macaws are types of parrots, right? And you know that Okay, the parakeets and the parrots, uh, the parakeets and macaws are parrots, and we know that the parrot repeats what you say. Okay, now the lady compares air perda, which is an embodiment of the social conventions of her society, to parakeets and macaws in other words if she sheds off shed off s h e d off o double f if she sheds off these conventions this bird she will be found by her society she will be found out by her society i.e. the society will know that she has challenged, she has subverted the conventions of her society. Okay? So she considers these conventions as a burden that she cannot take off. Attendants, oh chatterers, attendance of the eyelash okay so the veils that she has on her eyes on her mouth are attendants of the eyelash as well as of the mouth i.e they prevent her from seeing with her own eyes this is the meaning of attendance of the eyelash they prevent her from expressing her own ideas so this is the first part of the poem. Okay, so the poem is divided into two parts. The first part presents the status, S-T-A-U-S, of the female figure in a patriarchal society. Okay, so the woman in a patriarchal society is oppressed. is deprived of her freedom. She has no rights at all. And she expresses all of these within the first, let's say, 35 lines of the poem. Okay? So the poem is made up of two parts. The first part that expresses or reflects the status of woman in a patriarchal society and the second part shows the reader how the female figure in this poem rebels against her society. So here, if you want to write an essay on this poem, you have to divide the body of this essay into two parts. The first part that presents the status of women in a patriarchal society, and the second part shows how the woman rebels or is to rebel against her patriarchal society. This is how you should organize your ideas. Okay? So here you have an introduction, which is the first paragraph. The second paragraph is the methodology, which is the definition of the feminist literary theory. Then the second Part, i.e., the body should be divided into two parts A, B, capital A and capital B. Capital A should present the status of women in their patriarchal society. Here you may have more than one paragraph. So if you have more than one paragraph, you should have one, two, three, four when you write your outline. Then under B, you write, you give it a title Women's Rebellion Against 
their patriarchal society. Okay, so the second part of the poem deals with how Sylvia Plath wants women to, to rebel against their patriarchal society. So the lady says, Oh, chatterers, attendants of the eyelash, I shall unloose one feather like the peacock. So the one feather is one of the conventions of her society. One veil. It is one veil, and you have to spell it very properly. V-E-I-L. And you have to make sure that on the exam I want to come across this spelled words. You have to know how to spell your words. And you have to know how to write patriarchal because in the past your friends or your colleagues used to write patriarchal and some of them wrote patriarchal. You have to memorize how to spell these words that are not familiar to you. Because on the exam, you will lose marks for whatever language mistake that you make. Be it a grammar mistake, a spelling mistake, or a structure mistake. So it is not a matter of memorizing the notes. Attendance of the eyelash, I shall unloose one feather like the peacock. Okay, so we know that the peacock is a certain kind of bird. And it is nice because it has nice feathers. Okay, now the lady compares the conventions of her society to the feathers of a peacock. Yes, they are like the feathers of a peacock because they are highly valued by her society. So the lady wants to rebel, R-E-B-E-L, rebel, not repel, rebel, R-E-B-E-L. The lady wants to rebel against, she wants to revolt, R-E-V-O-L-T, against her society by shedding one of the veils, i.e. one of the conventions, the customs that the society imposes on her. So this is the significance of the line, or of the lines, I shall unloose one feather like the peacock. I usually get tripped. Unloose has the same meaning as loose. And you may have come across these expressions in your introduction to linguistics course. I'm sure. You have some words that have un, and they express the same meaning as the words that do not have un. So loose and unloose have the same meaning. So she will shed one of the feathers that are highly valued by her society. Attendance of the eyelash. I she wants to get rid of the veil that covers her eyes. So she wants. <coughs> to see the world with her own eyes. She doesn't want to be or to act according to a certain truth or reality that she doesn't approve of. A reality that is imposed on her. Attendance of the lip. Now she wants to express herself. She wants to talk. Attendance of the lip. I shall unloose one note, shattering the chandelier of air that all day flies. It crystals a million ignorance. Okay. 
So now she wants to express herself. She wants to talk. She wants to express her feelings, her beliefs, her feelings, her own ideas, her own convictions. So that's why she says, a candles of the lip, I shall unloose one note, shattering the chandelier. And you know the meaning of the chandelier. It is clear, the chandelier is a, an article that gives you light. Okay, it is a kind of light that you have at your homes, shattering the chandelier of air that all day flies its crystals, a million ignorance. Okay, so the chandelier is symbolic of the truth and the facts that are fake according to the lady. Okay, so these truths and facts are like the chandelier of air, something that is not, li not, that is not real, something that is imaginary. It is the chandelier of air. Do you have a chandelier in the air? You have a chandelier that is fixed in the ceiling of your home or your room. But you can't have a chandelier hanging in the air. So that's why it is a chandelier of air that all day flies its crystals and million ignorance. So the fake values of her society that are imposed on women make women ignorant of the truth. So the woman wants to express their own view of reality and of the truth. <coughs> Attendant and at his next step. I shall unloose, I shall unloose from the small jewel doll he guards like a heart. Okay, so the husband values his wife as a jewel doll that he guards like a heart. He guards her like his heart. So she's like a doll. So from out, okay, she will unloose from this small jewel doll that he guards like a heart, the lioness, the shriek, in the bath, the cloak of hope. Okay? She will rebel against her husband. In other words, she will rebel against the patriarchal, against the patriarchal figure of her society, i.e. the male figure of her society. And she's not going to act as a tamed creature anymore, tamed, T-A-M-E-D, you tame an animal, okay, <coughs> so you may have a ferocious animal, ferocious, F-E-R-O-C-I-O-U-S, and you have to memorize the spelling of this word, because on the Shakespeare exam you misspell this word. Okay, so you may have a ferocious animal. You take that animal, you take care of it, you train it to become a domestic animal. This is the meaning of tame. So the lady sees herself as a tamed animal because the society controls her, the husband controls her, the male figure controls her. Okay, so she no longer wants to be a tamed animal, a tamed creature. She will rebel against her society like a ferocious animal. So that's why she says, I shall unloose the lioness. The lioness is a ferocious animal. So the lady wants to rebel ferociously against 
her patriarchal society. She shall unloose the shrink in the bath, i.e. she will cry at the top of her voice, at the top of her lungs. She's not going to remain silent. She, is, she doesn't want to be restricted to her house. She doesn't want to be restricted to doing her house duties. So the bath is symbolic of the world to which the woman is limited. So the female figure in a patriarchal society is not allowed to go beyond the boundaries of a certain world. The woman in a patriarchal society is not allowed to go beyond the limits or the boundaries of a certain world. Therefore, the world of a woman in a patriarchal society is her house. And the duties that she has to carry out are the duties of taking care of her house. So that's why she shall, i.e. she will unloose the shriek in the bath. So she wants to rebel against this condition. She wants to free herself from this world. She, she, she will unloose the cloak of holes. So this is the pearl that she puts on. The cloak, it is a dress. It is a mantle. So she wants to unloose the cloak of holes. So the cloak of holes is symbolic of the social conventions of her society. This is number one. Now, number two, it is a cloak of holes because it is a cloak of worn out, of old fashioned conventions. Old fashioned, OLD dash fashioned, F A S H I O L E D. Okay, so she wants to unloose the old conventions, old fashioned conventions of her society. So the conventions of her society are like a worn out dress that she is forced to put on, to wear. So the lady wants to get rid of it. So this is how Sylvia Plath expresses her project of liberating the female figure from the constraints of the patriarchal society. Okay? So therefore, the poem is made up of two parts. The first part deals with the status of women in a patriarchal society. The second part deals with how Sylvia Plath wants women to liberate themselves from this patriarchal society. Now, usually, on the exam, or when I give my students a certain assignment, I give them, let's say, a passage from a text, just as I do in the Shakespeare course. <coughs> so I may give you A question like this. Sylvia Plath concludes her poem. Can you write it down? Sylvia Plath concludes her perda, and you have to write perda within quotation marks because perda is the title of a short poem. Sylvia Plath concludes perda with the following stanzas. Let's say, attendance, 
and at his next step I shall unloose I shall unloose from the small jewel doll he guards like a heart the minus the shriek in the bath the cloak of holes period then I say discuss these are two stanzas right discuss these I think three stanzas. No, there are three stanzas. Discuss these stanzas with reference to Sylvia Plath's project of liberating women from the constraints of the patriarchal society. Okay? So why you answer a question like this? You don't have to discuss only the last or the second part of the poem. It means that you haven't understood the question. Okay? So to answer a question like this one, it is not enough to say that Sylvia Plus in Perga aims at giving women the freedom of expressing themselves, the freedom of seeing the world with their own ideas. She wants women to rebel ferociously like ferocious animals against society. So you can't write only a paragraph on this and turn it in as an answer. This is wrong, and you will not pass the course. To answer a question like this one, you have first of all to discuss the status of women in a patriarchal society as Sylvia Plath presents it in this particular poem. Okay? So in this case, you have to write a well-organized thought out a thing that shows your reader how Sylvia Plath wants women to liberate themselves. But before you show the reader how Sylvia Plath wants women to liberate themselves, you have to show your readers why she wants them to liberate themselves. So in this case, your essay will have the following format. First of all, you have to write the title. And here the title should not be perfect. You have to write a title that reflects the content of your essay. So if you write Perda on the exam, I will write a question mark next to it. So this is not an answer. This is not a title. So in this case, you will lose certain points. You write a title, then you write an introduction. So you may write an outline to help you organize your ideas. And in fact, you have to write an outline. I advise you to write an outline. So you have the title. Then number one, Roman numeral one, is the introduction. In the introduction, you write an introduction that is related to the poem, to the poem burden. So you may start as follows. In Perda, you write Perda, let's say, within quotation marks. And after Perda, you write within parentheses the date of the publication of the poem. And usually, on the exam, I give you the date of the publication of the poem. So let's say the poem was published in the Norton Anthology of American Literature in 1996. So you write in Perda, 1996, within parentheses, comma, then you write Sylvia Plath. Okay? So in, at the very beginning of your essay, you have to identify the poem that you're going to analyze, its date of publication, and the poet or the poem. So it is not enough to say, in Perda, the poet deals with the status of women in a patriarchal society. Which poet? I want to know. You have to suggest that I am totally ignorant. I know nothing. Okay? Yes. And, yes. and uh, Perda also, we have to write it uh, between parentheses. Did I say you have to write Perda within parentheses? Because it is the title. Did I say you have to write it within parentheses? No, in quotations. 
I said you write the title within quotation marks because it is the title of a short poem. Doctor? Yes? What about the name of the poetess? Nothing. Nothing, okay. You don't need to write the name of the poetess within quotation marks or within, within parentheses. I'm talking about titles of books and titles of articles, titles of journals, titles of short poems, titles of short essays. Okay? Titles of short poems, short essays, titles of articles, titles of chapters in books, titles of articles in journals, in newspapers, should be written within quotation marks. Write it down, please. Now, write it down now. I don't want you to go back to the recording later on, because the recording will be or the recorded lecture will be available for 20 days only. Titles of short poems. Titles of chapters in books. Titles of articles in journals or newspapers. Titles of short stories should be written within quotation marks. Now, titles of books such as novels, plays, i.e. tragedies and comedies, titles of encyclopedias, titles of dictionaries, titles of reference books, titles of epics, like the epic of Gilgamesh, the, the Aeneid, the Odyssey, the Iliad, titles of what? Of long poems, like the Wasteland, which runs into more than 20 pages, should be underlined. Okay, so you have read Hamlet. So when you refer to Hamlet, the play, you write Hamlet and you underline it. If you are typing on the computer, you have to italicize it, i.e. you use italics. يعني حرف مائل. You have this technique on the computer. Okay. So titles of books should be underlined or italicized. Okay. So when you write the introduction, at the very beginning of the introduction, you have to identify the title of the text that you're going to analyze, its date of publication, as well as the name of the writer of that text. Okay? So if it is a poet, you have to write the name of the poet. And you have to write the name, the full name of the poet. The first time that you mention the name of the writer, you have to mention his, fir his first name and his family name. So here you say, in Berger, Sylvia Plath deals with the status of women in a patriarchal society. You introduce the topic. <coughs> okay. Now, if you refer to the name of the author later on, I mean the essay, you may mention the family name only or the full name of the author. So neither say later on in the body of your essay. So in your class, let's say proposes that women should rebel against their patriarchal society. Or you can say plus only. So you either use the full name of the writer or the family name. But don't use the first name only. You can't say in subsequent references, this is what we call subsequent references. Okay? So at the very beginning, you mentioned the full name of the author. Later on, when you refer to the author, we call it subsequent reference. So in subsequent references to the author, you may mention the full name of the author or the family name of the author. Don't 
you lose the first game of those and you lose points, especially in my class. So I don't expect you to write in the body, Sylvia says, Sylvia is not your friend. Sylvia is not your daughter. Sylvia is not your sister. Sylvia is not your neighbor. You are not allowed to do it, whether in my class or in any other class. You either mention the full name of the author or the family name of the author in subsequent references to the author. But at the very beginning of your study, you have to mention the full name, i.e. the first name and the family name. Is it clear? Is it clear? Yes, Dr. Clear. Don't start your introduction with this poem start, deals with the status of women in a patriarchal society. Which poem are you referring to? More than 90% of the students of this course start their essays on the exam saying, in this poem we have the theme of the status of women in a patriarchal society. Or this poem deals with the status of women in a patriarchal society. Which poem are you dealing with? You drive me crazy when you write this poem deals with the status of women in a patriarchal society. I want to know the poem. I want to know its title. I want to know who wrote the poem. You are learning the techniques of writing a research paper. So you should identify the source and the author of the source at the very beginning. Okay, so you, when you write the introduction for your essay, you write, in Berger 1996, Berger within quotation marks, 1996, which is the date of the publication of the poem, within parentheses, comma, Sylvia Plus, then introduce your topic. Okay, so this is the first part of your essay, it is the introduction. So you introduce it, and you narrow down the introduction to a thesis statement. The thesis statement should tell me what you're going to write about in this essay. I don't want you to send me messages to the WhatsApp groups asking me how do we write an introduction to an essay on third. I am giving you the guidelines now. Okay, you have a question. Go on. Someone wants you said to say something. Write, what? We write the text publication between the brackets, then we close the bracket and uh, write a comma, or uh, we write the uh, name of the writer between the brackets also. And I it's up to the name of the author within brackets. What is the name of the author? Not that we have brackets, what a quotation marks, what an underline. Run it eight. Okay, thank you. Doctor? Yes? Can we say something about the author in the introduction? No, say nothing. We're not dealing with the poem from a, an autobiographic point of view. Nothing. This is what you usually do. You mention the name of Shakespeare and the date of his birth and the date of his death and the number of the sonnets and plays that you wrote, then all of a sudden you say that in this essay I will discuss Hamlet as a tragic hero. This is wrong. The introduction should be related to the text that you're going to analyze. Okay? The text here is further. So at the very beginning, right? In Perda, 19, 96, Sylvia Plath deals with the status of women in a patriarchal society. You present general ideas related to this topic, then you narrow it down to the thesis statement. In the thesis statement, you say, Plath aims at liberating women from the constraints of the patriarchal society that prevent women from expressing themselves freely. This is a possible thesis statement. 
Okay, so the first part of your outline is the introduction. This is number one, Roman number one. Roman numeral two is the methodology. After you, you write the introduction for your essay, you have to write the methodology. Which approach are you going to draw on as you analyze the topic? So your methodology here is feminism. So the second paragraph of your essay is a definition of the feminist movement. And here again, you don't have to mention the history of the emergence of the feminist movement in Europe. I don't care about this. I'm not asking you to write about the history of the feminist movement. So since you are writing a short research paper, it is enough to define, to present the principles of the feminist movement that apply to the poor. Okay? So in this case, you may talk about how the feminist movement portrays the position of women in a male-dominated society how these women are stripped of their rights, their freedom, and how the feminist movement aims at granting women their rights and their freedom. Okay? The things that are related to the poor. You are done with the methodology. You have number three now. Roman numeral three. It is the body. The body is divided into two Parts. So under body, you write capital A. Capital A means that you have to deal with the status of women in the patriarchal society. So capital A takes the following title, if you want. The status of women in a patriarchal society. Okay, so here you have more than one idea to discuss. First, let's say you have number one. You have one, two, three here. Under A, you use one, two, three. Capital A, the status of women in patriarchal society. So under A, you have one, two, three, depending on the ideas that you want to discuss. So here you may have lack of Freedom of expression. Lack of freedom of expression. Number two. Let's say lack of women's rights. Let's say you are done with A. So in your essay, you divide the body into two parts, the status of women in a patriarchal society. So you discuss lack of freedom of expression in a paragraph, lack of women's rights in a paragraph. If you have more, you have another paragraph, it could be number three. Now, you are done with the status of women, so you go to B, capital B. Women's Rebellion, you give it the following title, Women's, W-O-M-E-N. This is the plural of women. Women is the singular. Women is the plural, women, W-O-M-E-N, women, women's. Rebellion against their patriarchal society. This is B. So this is the second part of the body. So here you have only one paragraph. Then Roman numeral four, it is the conclusion. Are you taking notes? Yes, Dr. Yes, sure. of course. Okay. Then you write the conclusion. 
What do you do in the conclusion? <clears throat> First of all, you don't have to say in conclusion at the end, last but not least, finally, don't use these expressions. Let your conclusion grow spontaneously out of your argument. So don't use these expressions at all. So in the conclusion, you summarize the main points of your paper, i.e. you summarize the main points of the body. So you can say in pair that Sylvia Plath discusses the status of women in their patriarchal society. They lack the freedom of expression, the freedom of viewing the world with their own eyes. As a result, Sylvia Plath proposes that women should rebel ferociously against their society so that they will have their own freedom. This is a possible conclusion. So this is how you summarize the main points of your essay. Don't give recommendations. Don't give pieces of advice. I don't want you to say, I advise any woman to read Perda. I don't want you to say that Perda is a great work of art. It is not your duty to say whether it is great or not great. Don't say, Perda is a great poem that deals with the status of women in a patriarchal society. Don't use it. You have to be objective. And objectivity means that you don't have to give your own evaluation of a text, especially at this level. At the BA level, we don't expect you to pass on judgment on works of literature. You don't have the techniques and the skills to determine whether a work of literature is great or not. So in my classes, don't use these expressions. Is it clear? Yes, doctor. Yes, doctor. Okay. Do you know now why you don't pass the Shakespeare course easily? That's why you can't pass the Shakespeare course easily. So you can't write whatever comes to your mind. Your answer should be well organized. It should be grounded on palpable <coughs> information. So I don't expect you to write a summary of this poem on the exam, especially those who don't attend. Some students don't attend at all. So they take the poem on the exam and they paraphrase the stanzas. They are not going to pass. And if I give them 20 of 100, it means that I am generous. In fact, I should give them a zero, not 20. So I don't give you the poem to paraphrase it or to summarize it. I give you the poem to quote and to analyze the quotes and to document the quotes. Doctor? Yes? If we're going uh, to give um, in, in the explanation in the body paragraph uh, some parts of the poem, can we, as an example, I didn't hear you well. Repeat your question. I mean, in the body paragraph, while, yeah. while we are explaining the poem, if we, uh, can we like take uh, part of the poem and uh, write it? Of course, you have to, to quote. You are writing a research paper. If you don't quote the poem, it means that you're not writing a research paper. So that's why I give you the poem on the exam. I want to make sure that you have mastered the skills of writing a research paper. So the exam is a mini research paper. So on the exam, you have to take lines, you may take stanzas, you quote them, and you have to introduce the quote. You have to document the quote at the end. 
and you have to analyze it. It is not a matter of introducing, of inserting a line or a stanza into the poem without analyzing it. And I said last time, uh, your quote in this case will be, okay, I said last time, your quote will be dangling. Okay, I, it is related. Neither to what precedes it, nor to what follows it. يعني ما يلعب لي على اللي بيقبل ولا لا اللي بيبعد. ده معلق. Okay, so the court either should complete something that you have mentioned, or it should be related to what you are going to mention. So you may say that Sylvia Plath wants women to rebel in order to be able to express themselves. Period. She says, comma, here you quote, attendance of the lip, I shall unloose one note, shattering the chandelier of air that all day flies its crystals, a million ignorance. You have to quote these one, two, three stanzas. You have to quote accurately. So it's not enough to say that she says, attendance of the lip, you write it within quotation marks, you write the page number, let's say 132, period, then you analyze it, this is wrong. You have to quote accurately. When you say attendance of the lip, I don't know what you want to say. So the quote should be accurate. So as I read it, I will understand what you want to say. And don't write like the first word of the quote, then you write three, four dots, then the last word. I will say quote accurately, and in this case, you will fail. When you <laughs> quote, you don't have to use ellipses. You may omit a word from a wrong quote, you may omit a sentence, a phrase, if it is not necessary, but you can't write the first word, let's say, of the statement that you quote and the last word. Don't do it. This is not academic. This is Subductive? not professional. Yes. Uh, sometimes uh, if uh, if we want uh, like to relate to just one word, for example, if we're going to say uh, feather, for example. What? If, for example, we want to uh, to take example of just one word of the of the poem and uh, elaborate it. For example, when uh, if we say veil or feather, we should put it uh, within quotation marks. Of course, it is taken from the poem. It is not your word. Okay. Can me, doctor? Can say she compares uh, one of the conventions of her society to A, and then you write feather within quotation marks, and you write the page number. Excuse me, doctor. Yes? Uh, will we be provided the page number also? Of course, on the exam. Okay, you don't have to memorize the page numbers that you have here. On the exam, I will number the pages of the exam. One, two, three, four. Okay, so what do we do with the page number? Wait a minute. If you take a line that is typed on page one, at the end of the line, write one. Use the numbers that I provide on the exam. Is it clear? Yes, doctor. What do we do with the That's page number? Do we underline quotations, anything? So uh, the number brackets or anything? No. When you write the number of the page, you write it within parentheses. Okay, thank you. Okay, so if you are a language student, you write small p, period, then the number one. If you are a literature student, you write only one within parentheses. Okay, we don't need the p according to the MLA style sheet. We will discuss this later on. Okay, but you don't have to write line one, line two, line three. I think you do, you do this in your other courses. I don't know why. And some of the students on the exam that they take for this course, especially those who don't attend, write, when they document their lines, they write line one, line two, line three. 
this is wrong. We don't mention the number of the lines that we quote. We mention the number of the page on which these lines occur. Doctor. Okay, you don't have to say line one, line two. You don't have to mention the line. Okay. Even if you say 10 lines, 100 lines, you don't have to write line one, line two, line 100. Mention the number of the page. Okay, doctor, and one more question. What about yeah. the stanza? You don't have to write stanza. Okay. We don't use stanza line when we document a poem. We mention only the page of the, the number of the page. And you don't have to say in your analysis in stanza one, Sylvia plus says X, Y, and Z. In stanza two, this is not academic. Okay, so if you That's proceed, it. wait a minute, let me complete my own idea. If you proceed according to the outline that I have dictated to you, it means that you have to organize your ideas in a certain way. So you don't have to write, let's say, the introduction. Then after the introduction, you write the methodology. And after you write the methodology, you say, in stanza one, the woman compares herself to a jade, which is a precious stone. It is wrong. You don't have to analyze the poem stanza by stanza as I'm doing. I analyze the poem stanza by stanza to show you how to read a poem. I read it to show you how to read between the lines. Okay, so I go about it by analyzing every single line to show you how a student of literature should analyze a poem. So on the exam, you don't have to do what I'm doing now. Okay, so it is your duty to organize your ideas. So on the exam, I don't expect you to say in stanza one, so the class describes women as jades, i.e. precious stones described, uh, possessed by their husbands. In stanza four, she says that uh, even by night, she is not allowed to be herself. You don't need to refer to stanzas. Okay, go on. You have a question. Uh, yes, doctor. If you uh, provide us, for example, the last two stanzas in the, in the exam. On the exam, I will give you the poem as it is. Oh, and you ask us, for example, to discuss the last... Uh, Wait a minute. On the exam, I will give you the poem as it is, even if the, the poem runs into 100 pages. Okay. okay. So on the exam, I will give you the whole poem as it is. Then I will give you a topic related to the poem. So I may take a stanza. And I say discuss with reference to a certain theme related to the poem. Or I may not write a stanza. I may give you a statement, my own statement. And then I say discuss with reference to this poem. Is it clear? Yes, Dr. Yeah. Okay. So I may give you this poem on the exam. And I may take the last three stanzas I say, Sylvia Plath includes the poem of the last two stanzas or three stanzas why discuss in detail so i don't give you a clue to the answer so i may give you the following question why does sylvia plus include her poem of the last three stanzas Doctor. discuss in detail so it means that you have to scratch your imagination you have to scratch your head as the English say, it is not a translation from Arabic. The English say scratch your head. The Americans say scratch your imagination. So you have to think. So if I say, why does Sylvia Plath conclude the poem with the last four or three stanzas, you have yourself to know the topic that I want you to discuss. So you have to know that you have to discuss the status of women as well as the project of liberating women. Or sometimes I may say Sylvia Plath proposes that women should 
rebel ferociously in order to liberate themselves from the constraints of the patriarchal society discussed in detail. Again, here you have to discuss not only the process of liberating women, but also the process of enslaving women. Okay? So the patriarchal society enslaves the women. As a result of this enslavement, Sylvia Plath proposes a certain kind of revolution. And the revolution that she proposes is a ferocious one. It is not a peaceful revolution. Okay? So she has to assert herself. She has to assert her identity. How? By rebelling against her husband. So this is the first step. So if you rebel against your husband, you will be able to be uh, to, to gain your rights. You have a question, go on. Yes, doctor, can I ask you something? Yes, please. Okay, one by one, who wants to ask? Can I ask you, doctor, please? What's your name? Sahaila. Dr. Sibleni? Sahaila, Sahaila. Me? Sahaila. Sahaila, hello. Yes. Okay, doctor. Sahaila, go on. So I was just saying that can we so we're going to discuss uh, the topic according to the to the content of the stanzas that you uh, provide okay, according to the poem not according to your own ideas yes yes i mean uh, when you give us the whole poem doctor and you you talk you told you tell us to talk about uh, a certain topic according to the stanzas that you provide right not only according to the stanzas wait a minute no, no, I mean not the whole poem, but the things that you've uh, you've pointed at, right? How come? How come? I said if I give you the last four stanzas and I say why does Sylvia Plath conclude the poem with these stanzas, it doesn't mean that you have only to discuss women's rebellion against their society. You have to discuss first the status of women in the patriarchal society, which is the first half of the poem. Then you proceed to the second half, which presents the liberation of women. It is not enough to discuss that she wants women to rebel. Yes, doctor. Okay. And I dictated the outline to you. Didn't you write the outline? Yes, doctor. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Another student has a question. What is it? Yes, I want to check something. What's your name? We document right after the quote, not after our analysis, right? Repeat your question. We document, we document the quote right after the quote, not after our analysis, true? Of course, after the quote. If you document after your analysis, it means that your analysis is taken from a certain source and you are documenting the source. So it means that this is not your own analysis. It is the analysis of someone else. Okay, thank you. Okay, so at the end of the quote, you directly mention the date of the publication of the text and the page number if you are a language student. If you are a literature student, you mention the number of the page only. Directly, after the quote. Is it clear? If we are language students, we don't mention only the page of the number, number of pages. If you are a language student, you have to mention the date of the publication of the text, comma, followed by P, dot, then the number of the page. Literature students have to use the MLA style sheet they write the number of the page only. So within parentheses, the literature students write maybe one or two or three. Okay, we will discuss this later on, don't we? Yes. Uh, do you advise us while writing uh, an academic essay to use lots of, uh, of quotations? For example, uh, here in our analysis of, uh, of Sylvia Plath. It depends. If you need to, of course, you have to use quotes to show me that you know how to introduce the quote, how to document it, how to analyze it. Okay? So you don't have to quote 
for every single idea, I think. Sometimes you may paraphrase, since this is a poem. So we may take a statement from the poem by paraphrasing it without quoting it exactly. Okay, so we have different ways of using the information or of introducing the information that we take from a source. So we either present the information as it is without changing anything. So in this case, you write it within quotation marks. This is it, i.e. quoting. We summarize, i.e. if you are reading a novel or a play and you want to quote, you don't need to quote a long passage. So you read it, you understand it, you summarize it in your own words. And at the end of the summary, you write the page number. Again, this is a kind of uh, using a source. And in the case of a poem or in any other thing, it is not necessarily a poem. You may have two ideas. You don't want to present the two ideas as they are. You paraphrase them in your words. Okay. And in this case, you have to document. Uh, although if we paraphrase or summarize, we, we have to... Uh... Document, yes, of course, but you don't have to write it within quotation marks. Okay, Excuse me, doctor. you write only the exact quote within quotation marks. If you paraphrase or summarize, you don't need, if you paraphrase or summarize, you don't need to use quotation marks. But at the end, you have a document to show me that <coughs> this is not your own idea. In this case, you show me that you are either paraphrasing or summarizing something taken from another source. But if in the summary, within the summary or the paraphrase, you take a word or a phrase as it is, or a sentence as it is from the original source, you write the sentence or the phrase within quotation marks. Is it clear? So you may summarize a long passage, a page, a long paragraph. So you summarize the paragraph, let's say, in four sentences. Okay, so these four sentences may contain a sentence or a phrase that is taken as it is from the original source. So this phrase or this sentence only should be written within quotation marks. Is it clear? Yeah. Yes, doctor. One more question, please. Okay. When exactly should we mention the page number? Directly at the end of the quote. At the end of the paraphrase, at the end of the summary. Oh. Okay. But doctor. Yes. While paraphrasing, already we're going to say uh, that uh, this is uh, Sylvia Plot's point uh, point of view, and it it will be obvious that you are uh, paraphrasing her own points of view. Okay, okay. I want to know where her statement ends and where your statement starts. Is it clear? Yes. Yes. I want to know where her own statement ends and where your statement starts. Is it clear? Yes, doctor. Okay, do you have any more questions? Any more questions? No. Okay, let's go back to your book. So the last time we did a sample student essay, right? And I showed you how you should avoid certain mistakes that students usually do. At the end of this chapter, you have a chapter entitled Argumentation. Do you have the book with you? Yes. 
Okay, argumentation. We are not going to do this chapter now. Skip it. Skip this chapter. After this chapter, you have a chapter entitled Writing a Summary. Can you find it? Yes, doctor. Page 349. Okay. 349, but you have to number your pages, as I said. Page you have to number the pages so that we can have easy access to the number of the pages of the book. Because the chapters, as I told you, are taken from different sources. They are taken from different books. So if I say page 349, you may have another page 349. So number your pages. I have numbered by the pages of my book. So the chapter on writing a summary starts on page 21, according to my own numbering of the pages. OK, so writing a summary. So I will introduce how to write a summary. This is our second or third chapter, maybe fourth. The first chapter was on how to write an essay, and I discussed the final approach. The second chapter was related to the different points of view that we may use as we write our essays. The third chapter was Sylvia Plath's third. So this is the fourth. Writing a summary. Okay. So why do we ask our students to write a summary? Now writing a summary is both a reading skill and a writing skill. Okay? Writing a summary is both a reading skill and a writing skill. Why is it a reading skill? Now, when we teach reading, we use different methods of teaching reading. Okay? So you may have the closed procedure approach. You may have the method of writing a summary. Okay? So when I give you a reading passage, I ask you to summarize what you have understood. So when I read the summary, I make sure that you have a certain level of understanding a certain reading passage. So in this case, writing a summary in a reading class is a means that shows the, the teacher that you have a certain level of comprehending, of understanding a certain passage. Okay, so it is a means that helps your teacher evaluate the comprehension level that you have, okay? So we re ask you to read, and then we ask you to summarize, let's say, the main ideas and the main supporting details. This is number one. Number two, writing a summary is a writing skill because we teach the student how to organize his or her ideas. So when you summarize, you don't summarize uh, without following certain rules. When you summarize, you have to pay attention to your language skills, i.e. grammar, writing, spelling, structure, organization. So when we ask you to summarize, we ask you to write a well-organized summary. Okay? So at university level, we don't expect you to summarize a passage the way you used to do at school. When you summarize an article or a chapter or a book, we expect the student to express or to write the summary using his or her own language. So that's why when you write your own summary, we want to hear your voice. Okay, I want to hear 
your voice and your voice is your style in composition. And I referred to this before. I said the voice in composition is the style. So when I say to my writing class students, I want to hear your voices, it means that I want to to come across your own styles, I your own way of writing. And the rhythm, as I said before, refers to the different types of sentence structure that you use. Okay? So if you use one type of sentence structure, it means that uh, your essay is monotonous. It is boring. And it is unacademic to write an essay or a research paper or an MA thesis or a book using simple sentences only or complex sentences only or compound sentences only or compound complex sentences only. You have to use a variety of sentence structure. Okay? So when you write a summary, you have to write the summary using your own words and your own style. So you, I don't expect you to take sentences from the passage as they are and then you put them together as a summary. This is not a summary. Okay? So the summary should reflect your voice. Okay? So that's why you say a summary is a reading as well as a writing skill. Okay? So when you write a summary, you bring together your study skills because when you read a summary, when you read a passage to summarize, you have to underline, to highlight the main ideas, the main supporting details, and the secondary supporting details to understand it. Okay? So when you summarize, you read it, let's say, you read the passage to get an idea about it, a general idea, a glimpse, a gist. Then you write it to identify, let's say, the main ideas. You read it the second time to identify the main ideas. Then you read it the third time to identify the, the supporting details. Okay? Then you may read it for the fourth time to identify the main supporting details. So this is what we call study skills. Okay? So when you summarize, you draw on your study skills, on your reading skills, as well as on your writing skills, because at the end, you have to write your final draft of the summary. So I don't expect you, as a teacher, to write a first draft summary. I don't accept a first draft summary. You write the first draft, you read it, you proofread it to make Corrections whenever necessary and wherever necessary, then you write the final draft. So that's why writing a summary is a reading, a study, and a writing skill. Why do we teach you how to write a summary at this level? We teach you to write a summary because you need sometimes to summarize a long passage when you write a research paper. Okay, so sometimes you may have a certain idea that is very important for your research and you realize that you need to quote it, but you can't quote, let's say, two pages. So you read it or you read the two pages, you understand them, you point out the main ideas, maybe main supporting details, and you summarize the two pages maybe in three or four sentences. So that's one reason why we teach you how to summarize. Number two, we teach you how to summarize because when you write a proposal for your MA thesis or your for PhD dissertation, you have to summarize your findings. Okay? So you may write, you may want to write, let's say, on Shakespeare, let's say, from a feminist point of view. Okay? So you choose the plays that Shakespeare wrote and the plays that lend themselves to a feminist reading. You read them. You have to read them. You analyze them. You come up with your analysis, 
Okay, so now we have to write the proposals to convince your reader of your of the originality of your topic. So here you have to write, let's say, an introduction. The introduction is a summary of the findings that you have come up with. Okay, so if your MA thesis is going to be or is going to include three main chapters or four main chapters, these four main chapters are to be summarized in two or three pages. So that's why you need to summarize, you know, summarize. And after you introduce the topic, you have to write a review of literature. And the review of literature is also a summary of the literature that has been written on a certain topic. So you may read books, you may read MA theses, PhD dissertations, articles. So in this case, you have to read and to summarize these books, these articles in, in paragraphs. So may, you may summarize a whole book in a paragraph or two. So in this case, you need to know how to summarize. This is clear. And at the end, okay, you present a review of literature, you present a methodology, you present your research questions. At the end, you have to write a, an outline for your MA thesis. So you have to show your readers how many chapters you're going to present in this MA thesis and what you're going to write in each chapter. So in this case, you may write a, a, a paragraph of the content of each chapter. So that's why you need to know how to summarize. Okay, so next time, I think time's up, right? Okay, next time, yes. I will show you how to summarize professionally. At the end of this part, I will teach you how to summarize an article only. I'm not going to show you how to summarize a book. Okay, so if you know how to summarize an article, you will know or you will be able to summarize a book. And in this course, you're not going to summarize books. So we have the first page and the second page of this book. Doctor? Doctor? I want to ask you a question about summarizing. Isn't summarizing is paraphrasing? As if you lost connection. He will explain later uh, the difference between uh, paraphrasing and uh, summarizing. There are two different chapters in the book. Oh, really? Yes. So should we leave the meeting? He may I think, think so. I think. Oh, the doctor left. قطعت عنا الكهرباء هو بمنطقتنا الهاي فش عنده يو بي اس did he assign yeah. anything for us for next time sorry girls uh, do you have a group on whatsapp yes we do yes uh, please uh, can you add me Send Do you know how to send the link? I don't know how to send the link. I don't know how to send the link. I don't know how to send the link. I انت منك بولا جروب للجامعة؟ بصراحة أنا فورس يير اوف يونيفرستي وما عاد عندي إلا برنسبل ويعني مادتين باقيين بس انت منك مشاركة بولا جروب إذا احكي لنا على شي جروب قصدي منشان لا لا أنا أبدا ماني نو نو أنا بولا جروب بس بليز بدي رقم حدا لحتى احكي حتى يبعث لي حدا اللي هو برايفت 
على التيم ما بعرف عارف ولا شيء دغري بتعمل شيء في الكيس عندك بتبين هو تنس شيء مكرف بس انا اذا بدي اعزكم يعني بس حدا يعطينا رقمه بسجلوا وانه اتس فاين يعني طب سيفت عندك اذا بدك سفن يلا يس 016 يس 95 95 سو 71016695 اوكي and uh, the so test is over. Bye. You can leave.